Well, a lot of stuff to be thankful for, that's for sure. So let's pray together. God, we thank you again, just as we have many, many, many times in the last year, that you are faithful to us, that you are working in powerful ways in our midst, and you have revealed your working ways to us so we can see the work that you're doing. And God, I pray that, that as you continue to do that, you would give us more courage to join you in the work that you're doing and allow us to trust you more deeply, to not have a response of fear, but to have a, a response of trust, to know, God, that you're in all things, that you have lessons to teach us in all things, that nothing happens outside of your control, that even in the most traumatic circumstances, God, we know that you are at work. And if we look, we will see the great things that you are doing in and amongst all the things around us. So God, we thank you for this testimony for Dean and this uh, job opening that you've opened for him. And we pray, God, even as he's right down the hall in the same building, that you would continue to use him to, to speak these spiritual truths into these people's lives. And God, that you would uh, use him to bring about a change in people's hearts for your kingdom and your glory. And God, we think of other things that were said today. I know many of us are struggling Physically, people are struggling financially. People are struggling in relationships. God, we can all have a list of things that we're struggling through. And we place those at your feet and we say, we need you. We're so dependent upon you. God, I pray that you would work and you would heal us and that you would give us a, a great sense of your presence so we could feel your peace as we go day in and day out through the things that you've put before us, Lord, or we've put before us, and you're walking through with us. So God, we thank you for this special season as we focus on Christmas. Thank you, God, for the things we've done already, the time of caroling, which was wonderful to see so many families come out and carol together, for the families that we blessed by singing your praises as we walked up and down the streets, the people driving by and the, the people listening from their houses. God, we just pray that, that by lifting your name up, you are glorified and that you would do your work in their hearts. And this morning, too, we open our time now and just ask for you to speak to our hearts. Pray that this Christmas story, as we continue to focus on it, would just drill down deeper into our hearts, and that in the midst of that, you would pull out deeper insights than we ever have had before. Teach us, God, in the familiar and in the unfamiliar. Teach us your lessons. Amen. Amen. Cool. Well, I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. We're like halfway through Christmas stuff weird to say that already, halfway through. We had the caroling on Wednesday, which was a lot of fun. It was really neat to see from the littlest guys to some of us older people being able to just join together and sing. And as advertised, I sang loudly and I sang not that greatly. But I was surrounded by other people, so it was all right. Elizabeth a few times said, what key are we singing in? And I'm like, I have no idea. Let's just sing. Okay, you start. <laughs> you start. So it was great. It was a great chance for us to come together and, and do those things. And then last night we had the first um, Christmas drama. And I invite you to come tonight at 6 if you weren't able to join us last night to come and hear again the voices of Christmas. People from the nativity scene, just as you see up here in a sec, come to life and tell you their story from their perspective. And that's what we've been doing the last few weeks, looking at Zechariah's story, and Elizabeth's story, and Mary's story, and Joseph's story, and then the shepherd's story, and today we're going to focus on the wise men and see their story. And again, my whole plan here is to try to cause you to see a familiar story from a different perspective. Because even this week, as, I, as I've been chiseling down a little bit deeper to find things that I haven't seen before in the Christmas story, I found more. I found some perspectives I haven't seen, and I'm sure as I share them with you today, for many of us, they'll be new as well. Well, one of the things that I want to do is I want to dispel those Christmas rumors that we have out of those romantic pictures of what the nativity scene looked like, which most nativity scenes are not accurate in their depiction of the birth of Christ. And we've kind of got this idea that what we see on television and Charlie Brown specials and what we see in uh, the Grinch Stole Christmas and what we see as we go and stand in the middle of many many public squares and see the displays that they have about Christmas, that that is the true rendition of Christ. And then we fit in the Jesus story into that. 
And whether we realize it or not, that's really how our mind is processing this season. So today to help you, we're going to take a wise men quiz. Ready? Wise men quiz. The very first time I took this wise men quiz, I failed miserably. So let's see how you do today. Ready? First question. Number one. How many wise men were there? If you want to, you can uh, just grab your bulletin and write it down. All right, just take a little note. How many wise men were there? First question. Number two, where did the wise men first go when they saw the star in the sky? Where did they first go? Number three, where did the star lead them? Where did the star lead them? Number four, what town did they find Jesus in? Where was Christ when they found him? And the last one in this short quiz is who sent them to Bethlehem? Who sent them to Bethlehem? Ready? Question number one. How many wise men were there? Oh, sorry. How many wise men were there? We don't know. We don't know, but they're obviously 100% were not three. We're not three. They we're closer to 30 to 50. That's what they would have been closer to. Why do we think there's what, three wise men? Because there's three gifts that were given, and 50 wise men would not fit in your nativity scene. <laughs> they just wouldn't. How's that? You know what? We should start something new and have biblically accurate nativity scenes. We could sell each wise man for a dollar. <laughs> And have one of those sets that never ends, right? You guys know those things. Yeah. Number two, where did the wise... Oh, sorry. Where did, where did the wise men first go? I don't want to put the answers up there before you give them to me. Pardon? Where was Herod? They went to Jerusalem. The first place they went to see Herod in Jerusalem. First place. Where did the star lead them? Nope. Where did the star lead them? What? Well, yeah, but to Jesus. Where was Jesus? To the house where the child was. To the house where the child was. That's where the star led them. To the house where the child was. What town did they find Jesus in? In, in essence, where was the house? Anyone? We don't know. We don't know where they were. We don't know where that house was. Many speculate that it was in Bethlehem, but the Bible isn't clear, and they could have been anywhere in that area specifically. So after the baby was born, they didn't want to travel right back with the, the newborn baby, so it's very popular that, that Joseph found a place for them to settle down, temporary apartment kind of thing, for them to, to start their new life together, and they just found somewhere in that area. They, they hadn't traveled all the way home yet. It could have been in Bethlehem. It could have been outside of Bethlehem. It could have been nearby. It could have been out where the shepherds were watching their flocks by night. We don't know where they settled down. But I'll give you a clue. It wasn't in the nativity scene. That's for sure. Who sent them to Bethlehem? Close. Close. Herod's wise men. Herod's wise men were the ones that knew where the baby was to be born because they dug deeper. And they were the ones to send the, the wise men towards Bethlehem. And as they were traveling, it said the star went and showed them where the child lay. Some of you are like, I don't believe you, so let's look at it in Luke. Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going. Matthew chapter 2. Here, I'll read it for you. You guys can read along. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Now, you've got to realize that most biblical traditions that we have in the NIV come, come out of what we have in the King James Bible. And there's a lot of things that we have in the King James Bible that are not accurate translations that happened because King James liked the wording better than the actual wording that were, was there. So worship him is a bad translation for, for this passage. It should be translated, they bowed down to him. That's what it should be. 
Now, you know, you can bow down to someone out of respect and honor without worshiping them, can't you? In our mindset, worshiping comes from a heart of belief, it comes from a heart of love, comes from a heart of adoration. And those words are not implied in this description. What's implied in this description is just as if you had gone to where there was a king, you would bow before the king. And if you didn't, it was incredibly disrespectful for you not to do that. In some places, they would say three words. What were they? Off with your head. Four words, off with your head, <laughs> if you didn't do that. All right, so just so you know, that worship him should be bow down before him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, which we could call wise men there, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd of my people Israel. And that's from Micah 5.2 specifically. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, Go, make a careful search for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And again, this translation of that term worship has nothing to do with adoration. It has nothing to do with praise. It has everything to do with show my proper respect to him. So we can't say that Herod was a believer in Christ, a worshiper in Christ, just because this word is found in this translation. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So, that's the true story of the wise men. Now, a couple of uh, rounded out things for you to try to understand this in a deeper way is that wise men or, or magi should be or could be, I'll put it on the should-be side, translated as astrologers. That's what it should have been, professional astrologers. It was their job during this time period to look into the heavens and to see changes that are there in the heavens. And when they found changes in the heaven, it would mark things that were special coming up, or special things that you know, they were the first to see, the first to notice that something was there. And that's what they had done. Now, Many times God would use these people, he would speak to their hearts, he would give them prophecies in order to write down based upon things that were happening or were to happen. And they were the ones that would first indicate these things and bring to the leaders that there's something happening. In many ways, they were the scientists, the professional scientists during their time period. They were connecting the physical world, the things that they observed all around them, to the spiritual world and the things that God was doing in their midst. And we see in Scripture many, many, many times, if you see the word translated as magi, wise man, astrologer, um, um, sages is another word that would be translated. They're all the same word, and it's just different nuances that we've used in the translation process. And again, many of them come out of the King James tradition, where King James would say, this is the word I like best, let's go with this one. I don't like these other ones, let's not use those. And if you look at a variety of modern translations, you'll see different words being used. And if you go to some of the literal translations, you'll see that the word astrologer is listed in most of these places, because that's the best literal translation that's there. And one of the reasons we don't use that today is because to us, astrologer is different, isn't it? Astrologer is someone who uses those kinds of things to make predictions based upon whatever they think, without referencing God whatsoever. So it's a different idea here. So don't think that these guys were horoscope guys, because that's not who they were. That's not what's happening here. They are used by God to do his purposes in this astronomical way. That, that's what's happening here. So God brought them into this story to help build a solid history to the birth of Christ. You know, many people wonder, why, why did the wise men come? Why is this important? And many times we look and see the way that things were taking place during this time is far different than what happens today. Like many people have said to me, how come there's not dates, you know, the calendar dates that, that took place? You'll see that like in the third year of the reign of this person, so-and-so happened. 
They didn't date things the way that we did, nor did they record things the way that we did. Today, if something happens in five minutes, how many things are written about that? You know, there's like five million things that are written about those things. It's very important for us to create these records. History books are being written every day today. Back then, if they had one guy doing a history, they were doing great. If they had two doing it, it was exceptional. If they had three, it was unheard of. So when we find people who are writing down the things that are happening specifically in different areas of the world instead of just in that narrow uh, place that they're in, we're doing really well. So God said, in the midst of this, I'm going to take these guys from far away who understand biblical prophecy, and I'm going to use them in order to date, in order to validate, in order to be able to hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, put my stamp of approval on this that it's not just a spiritual story, that it's not just this romantic thing, that we can use the things that were being used at that time period to validate the things that were going on in culture in order to show us today that this was a factual story, not just something that the Jews made up or not just something that the early Christians made up. Isn't that neat? Isn't that cool that we can do that? I think it's really amazing that God did that. Let's look a little bit more. By the way, yeah, I did hit that. Daniel was a magi. See, now we would say, you don't call Daniel an astrologer because we would think that's horoscopes and things like that today. But Daniel's description when he was before King Darius was the exact same description that we have here of these wise men. And in fact, it was some of the things that Daniel did during the time that he was an astrologer, a magi, a wise man, that laid the foundation for these wise men that they came to see Christ. It was some of the prophecies that he wrote down, the predictions of the future that he wrote down, that these wise men in a faraway place were reading and watching for the signs. And it was the exact same time that Daniel wrote down that this new Jew would be born who was the king of the Jews. That these wise men were counting down the time on their clock. They, they, you know, they set the thing on their, on their day timer to tell them that look for a new king during this time period. And as they were studying the stars in the sky, they noticed a new star. And they knew that that was God's indication that that prediction that was made by Daniel had come true. Isn't that neat? That God would do that? That God would put Daniel in that position that he did, paving the way for the birth of Jesus Christ? Pretty cool. Also, Balaam's prophecy that a star would come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel was another thing that they pointed to. Now, Herod held them in high esteem. If these had just been like gypsy fortune tellers coming into town going, we saw something amazing, you need to listen to us, and they had no credibility, Herod would have said, get away from me. But the fact that Herod was troubled by what they had to say, the fact that Herod brought, brought them in and took their counsel, and he assembled all of his wise men and magi and astrologers and said, you guys check them out and make sure that what they're talking about is true. And they instantly said, oh yeah, we know what they're talking about. Maybe they missed the star. Maybe they saw the star and they were afraid to tell Herod what was going on. Maybe they did. But that too validates that these people were not just kind of passing through, that they knew what they were talking about. Herod took them seriously. Now, during this time period, when wise men traveled, they made a big deal of it. It's not as if it's one guy riding a camel on his trip. The guy would have been on the camel, and he probably would have had 50 people in front of him or 50 people behind him. Some of them would have been those uh, you know, great pictures of that time where they have uh, six strong guys carrying them everywhere they go. Right? Sheila, you went to see um, Living Christmas Trees. We got a chance to see that this year with the Coons. And during that, I think they did a really good job of bringing the wise men in. It was this huge procession. A couple of them came, just two people. But well, one guy came in, and there were all these people around him when they came in. And that's how wise men traveled during that time. They had a huge entourage with them. And they were not going anywhere quickly. They were not in a hurry to go anywhere they want because they, wherever they went, it was their presence that mattered. We're important people. Listen to us. Watch us. And they were, they were celebrities at that time. And as they were moving through an area, everybody noticed. Everybody came to see. It was the parade that was happening during that time. So when the wise men traveled, it was a big deal, a really big deal. 
Dozens of people would travel with them. Some people have intimated that as many as 200 people would have been traveling with each of these wise men. And you add to that that maybe 30 of them came to honor this baby that had been born. That could be thousands of people coming. A little different than sticking three of them in the back end of the nativity, isn't it? A little different. Now that's what would happen during this cultural time period. So, a little bit of change. And they came from a long distance. If they came from Babylon, which is the area that Daniel was in, it was about 800-mile trip for them to take. Imagine that. Even if you had 20 people in front of you and 20 people behind you and they were carrying you, how would they go? <laughs> how long would it take them to travel? Um, they estimated that it was about 20 miles a day they would cover. So it would take about 40 days each way for them to get to where they were. So they saw the star, they interpreted it, they figured out their, their game plan and where they were going. So you know, it, it was not the night that Christ was born that they showed up. Now God could have done that, but I think he didn't do that for a few reasons. I think he did it so that it would be a continuance uh, on Mary and Joseph of showing them that this was a special child. Can you imagine that? Mary sitting at home, stay-at-home mom, Joseph's out working, knock on the door, there's 50, 60 people there is the king here, and they come in, and they pay him his respect. Because remember in the, in the passage here, it said Mary and the child were home. It doesn't say Joseph was home. He was probably out working. Could you imagine that? Knock on the door. There were 30 or 40 that came to visit. Each of them had, we'll say, 100 people with them. That would have made a huge impression on Mary and Joseph. Now from Jerusalem, Bethlehem was just six miles away, so it was very easy for them to go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and that's where they were heading. And we don't know where that star was over that house. It could have been in, in Jerusalem. It could have been somewhere else. Just as the shepherds told of what they had heard and seen, no doubt many in the caravan of these wise men would have done the same thing too. So if they went all the way back to Babylon, if they went to other places from all around, it, it's a way that God used to just spread the word of who Jesus was and the amazing experience that took place. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people would have taken that experience of seeing this newborn king and spread it throughout the region, even more so than the shepherds were able to do. This could have been a preparation for the spreading of the good news that was going to take place in about 30 years. And then, again, more preparation for the spreading of the good news that took place as the apostles went out and Paul did his missionary journeys and the others went and traveled and spoke to people. It could be that God was preparing the way even more so through these people. Pretty neat when you see that, isn't it? Uh, based on most commentaries, they say that the wise men would have arrived up to two years after Jesus was born. Up to two years, that's a long time. Again, not the picture that we see in our nativity scene. And the star was real. There's been speculation over whether it was a vision or a dream or that kind of stuff. But most people writing about this say that the star was real. Other people mentioned something about that happening during that time period that were not not following um, the birth of Christ. So we do see some other people writing about a change taking place in, in the sky. Now, it might have been a new star that God added specifically just for this. Some people believe it was an alignment of planets that got really bright and people noticed it. But that doesn't make any sense because how then could an alignment of planets move over where the house was? So some have speculated that it's a star specifically created by God for this thing, which I know we can do or that it was an angel whose job it was to guide these wise men, and he did it appearing in the sky as if he was a star. Either could have happened. One, it was a miracle of God that it did occur, and two, God did it specifically for his timing and his purposes and his ways. So the three gifts. Three gifts were gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's why we, get, we thought that there's three wise men that were there. And these had great significance. Gold signifies royalty. If anybody gave someone a gift of gold, it was the most expensive thing that you could give to somebody. And can you imagine if they had 30 different wise men come and present to Christ gifts of gold? Mary's like, Joseph, can you add on another storeroom? We don't have a place to put all this stuff. And the frankincense. Frankincense is a resin used ceremonially for altar sacrifices indicating Christ's priesthood. Is that great? Royalty, priesthood. Whether the wise men knew it, 
they were pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ was God with the gifts that they were giving. And the last one was myrrh. It's a sap that's used in incense and perfume and is a stimulant tonic. And that is also a perfume that was used in order to put on, um, on dead people between the time of their, their death and their burial to try to mask the smell of the decay. So they were, they were marking that Christ was born to die for the sins of the world. I think it's neat that you did this. The symbolic significance also has practical use. That many commentators would say that one of the reasons that so much gold was brought to Jesus Christ is so that Mary and Joseph could use that gold during the time period that they had to flee and go to Egypt and, and travel and be able to get back to home without having to worry about that. That God was saying, I got this covered. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for your ways. And as they took care of that gold and the other things that were given to them, they would have had great means in order to take care of Jesus, particularly during the time they were in exile. Pretty neat, huh? I wonder if they had to hire some of those other guys to carry all this stuff around with them when they, when they fled. So you don't picture them really packing a backpack full of gold and taking off of that, do you? But we don't have that specifically. So why did they come? They came to show respect to this king. Wise men would do this for one reason primarily. And that reason was because if I put in my respect to you today, then you owe me. It's a positioning that would take place politically. I'm going to come and pay my regards to you. Therefore, when you rise into your power, you will remember me. So it was one of those things that was done out of respect. I mean, how many times do we see that polit politically today, right? We see the President of the U.S. or the Secretary of State going and shaking hands with people and looking all friendly for the photo op. You know, they don't have dinner together at each other's houses. They don't talk to each other on the phone. They're just doing that in order to posture themselves politically. That's what they're doing. And that's what the wise men were doing here with Christ. We have no indication whatsoever that they were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no indications that they came because they knew that he was going to be the Savior of the world. We have indications that they came because he was said to be the king of the Jews. And if Jerusalem was going to restore, God was going to restore Jerusalem into power, they wanted to be in a position to be ready to be part of that power that was going to be restored. That's probably what happened. Now, what did they learn through the experience? Uh, who knows what they learned specifically. We don't have anything in there. There's really not a lot that's clear on traditions that took place on how these people went back to their homes and if it changed their life at all. We really don't have anything about that solid. But their experience changed them. We're not really clear on that. It could be, it could be not. We're not sure at all. So that's the same question for you that we've asked the last few weeks. You know, do you see yourself in this picture? And to me, you know, it, it's the question about whether Christ makes a difference for you. I mean, we have these people that heard this story that goes against all odds, and they believed it, no matter how much sense it made. And then we had these people that heard, sitting out, watching their flocks by night, and angels came to declare the birth of Christ. And that experience changed them for the rest of their lives. And then we have these people who came to give respect, to say, I'm going to do this, because I'm supposed to. It's the right thing to do. I'm going to position myself in this place because I know that you are a king and I am a servant and I'm going to bow before you. But did they then walk away and not make a personal connection with him? You know, a lot of those same things about us. We hear something about God that is outstanding. God does miracles today. Many people don't believe in miracles. God sent his son to die on a cross and rise again. So many people today said Jesus Christ is the greatest piece of fiction ever created. Some people say that I'm going to kind of position myself in a place where I'll show him respect. So on that day when I need him, he's going to be there for me. Whether that's here on this life or at the judgment. Well, they'll say, I showed you respect. I believed in you. Or I positioned myself in a place where it came to show respect. And a lot of people do that at church. This is a time of year where a lot of people come to church at Christmas time who don't come the rest of the year. And they do that mostly 
to position themselves in a place where they can show God that respect. As if he was walking by and they bowed their head to respect him, but it didn't change them. We're all here somewhere. We're all in church today. Are you here to bow your head in respect? Are you here because God did something amazing in your life and you had to be here? Because not only did you want to proclaim it, but you wanted to be part of what he was doing and you wanted to be prepared for the next things that he is doing. That's what the shepherds would have done. Or are you like Zechariah, <laughs> Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, who said, these things are beyond anything I could ever imagine, but I'm positioning myself so you could use me, O oh God, to do things that go beyond description. My prayer is, we're like Zechariah. Well, actually, I'm like Zechariah because I see and I still have questions. That's what he did. Really? How can this be? And his penalty was he wasn't able to speak between that moment and the time that he was declaring John's name in the temple. So, next week we're going to be talking specifically about Herod, and Herod takes that next step for us. Herod is that person who saw all those things, experienced those things, and he hardened his heart against God. So my prayer is that we would not be like Herod. We would not be like the wise men. We would be like the shepherds. No matter where we are, no matter who we're like, we would have an experience with God that would change us the rest of our lives. And that we would go and it would lead us to a place where we would know him more and believe in him deeper. So, a couple days... It's going to be frenzy time at the base of the tree in your house and in my house. And for many of us, a lot of these things become forgotten things in the midst of all of that excitement. So my prayer for you is that maybe this Christmas can be different for you. That having had an experience coming before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it'll change. It's really neat to see the envelopes in the tree the envelopes in the tree seem small, but they're great in significance. See, the envelope in the tree is, is one little step for us to say, I'm going to make Christmas less about me and more about Jesus. And it might seem small, but as you start to put envelopes in the tree, it, it changes your heart. And all of a sudden, you find yourself saying, I get much more out of the envelope that I put in the tree than I do out of the gifts that are underneath the tree. How can I put more in and more in and more in? This week when we were caroling, one of the young girls that were with us caroling, we are back at the church having hot chocolate. She sits down next to me and with a grin from ear to ear, she says, PJ, I heard the voice of God for the first time ever in my life today. God told me to do this, and without hesitation, I went and did it. So cool. I said, you better write that down, and you better tuck that in an envelope in the tree. I'm not going to tell you more, because next Sunday, we're going to read it. It's right there. We're going to read what it is. It's not done. So we say, yeah, good job, kid. It was done to say, we worship you. We praise you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You have blessed us beyond all things. And I am doing this thing out of an act of obedience to you because of my love for you. And it changes us. Let's pray. God, may you change us this Christmas. I love the fact that the, the more we chisel down into stories that are recorded in Scripture, the more we find you, the more we find a depth of understanding, the more it takes away from these ideas that we have and these neat memories that we have, and it, it causes a more mature faith, a more mature understanding. Who is this little baby that had thousands of people knock on the door and lay gifts at your feet? Gifts that go beyond anything that we could give and value today. And yet many of them would have turned and walked away unchanged, having thought they've done their part, having bowed 
in submission to this new king, having positioned themselves in a place where in the future they would be remembered too. Maybe their hearts were stirred, but maybe they weren't. So I just pray for us today that you would just show us, Holy Spirit, right now in our hearts what our true connection with you is. And I pray that you would call us to have that deep, personal, intimate relationship that Mary had with you, that Joseph had with you, that Zechariah and Elizabeth and John had with you, Lord. May that be the model for us. And we, just as shepherds who have heard that we would go and pursue and that we would see and that we would experience and it would change us for the rest of our lives. And then we would go and spread this news and tell everybody that we know of the great things that you have done for us. And through that, Lord, that you would cause something great to happen in our midst. So God, I pray for these next couple days, special days. Pray for our family time and I pray for our times with our friends. I pray for safety as we travel. I just ask, oh God, that you would have your way and that you would have your will. And in the midst of all of the unwrapping and all of the eating and all of the talking and all of the football watching, God, that you would continue to remind us Christmas is all about you. So be with us this week. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. I love you. Merry Christmas. If you're not here tonight, if you're not here tomorrow night for Christmas Eve, Merry Christmas. Hope you have a great Christmas this year.